So a little bit about family businesses. They're often in the headlines every day. Um, I pointed out Banky as an example, because if you think about it in China, if it's, if it's not a state-owned enterprise, it's likely to be a family business. The European Commission actually has a definition that family-owned companies is if you have over 25% of the voting shares. So for example, News Corporation, Rupert Murdoch, he, I just looked it up before I came here today, he owns about 14.5% of the shares, but he has 38% of the voting rights. So in the family business world, we would consider him a family company. But just take the point that you know, there are different definitions of family companies out there. Li ka finally announced that he's going to hand the reins over. This is a very typical scenario, um, Li ka business, uh, where in Hong Kong, Taiwan, or Southeast Asia, it was founded post-World War II. And the second issue that is quite common in family businesses around the world is the founder takes a long time to step down. I kind of think of family businesses as two very distinct systems. You have the family system and the business system. Um, when the two gears work together, it's fantastic because the family provides stability and a long-term shareholder, which al allows the management to execute long-term plans. However, if the business starts going badly, then it'll cause a lot of issues within the family, especially if the family member is CEO. They'll say, my cousin's doing a terrible job. I'm not getting the same dividend anymore. At the same time, if the family side of the system is not going well, such as if there's family politics and everything, that can also be disruptive to the business. We also have to keep in mind there's very big differences between the family system and the business system. Family is about, gener family is about generations. Business is about quarter to quarter. Family is often about non-financial goals. Business tends to be about just pure shareholder returns, although a little bit of ESG these days. So you have to have the family system. You need good family governance. And on the business side, you not only need normal business governance, but you need family business governance. UBS did a study. It's about two years old. And they studied listed family companies from 2005 to 2015. And what they showed was that listed family companies worldwide outperformed non-family companies. Main reasons why were, well, family has their own money at stake, so they're more careful with it. They do less M&A, these uh, mergers and acquisitions tend to be value destructive. Um, there was a premium for when the, success, the founding generation was still in power. Um, and from a governance standpoint, it gave the director someone to talk to. But what this lower slide shows here in the lower corner, um, when you have the best performance is when you have a large founding shareholder. The next best is the far right, where you still have a large family shareholder in place. And then the worst case is when you have family firms with control enhancing mechanisms with extra votes per share or pyramid structure, et cetera. Family companies tend to have less leverage. They are more based on organic growth. And they invest where they know best. Family companies are managed for the downside. They're managed for resilience, not just performance. So in the down market, they do better but they don't do it quite as well in the up market. Okay, this is a little bit on uh, prevalence of family businesses. I'm sure you guys all know this in Asia. So if you pick an industry, say automobiles, there's BMW, VW, uh, Ford. If you pick financial services, you have Fidelity, which is owned by the Johnson family. This is um, uh, from McKinsey, and what they did a study on the emerging markets was that by 2025, in Southeast Asia, 80 to 90% of the firms with over a billion dollars in revenue will be family firms. Family businesses constitute over 80% of the businesses. In terms of contribution to GDP, anywhere from 60 to 70%. And employment's also around 60 to 70%. So family business is actually a very big contributor worldwide, not just Asia. Fundamental differences between family and business. Family is about you're, you feel entitled to it. Business is you feel like you uh, earned it. Uh, family is about emotions, business is about economics. And there's often a big divide within the family about those who are active versus those who are inactive in the business. Succession planning is often complicated by family politics. How do you divide your empire up? Do you do it to the one who loves you the most? Do you divide it equally because it's all fair? But if you divide your shares equally with each generation, shareholding becomes very fragmented. So that's going to be a problem, likely a problem down the road with fragmented shareholding. Or do you go to who is most capable? But who decides who is most capable? There are concentrated 
hopefully committed shareholder, and there's an identifiable shareholder. When you have the family involved as a concentrated owner, they take it differently because it's their own money at stake and their own reputation at stake. So as a result of that, they have the incentive to monitor the business. However, once you get um, the family factor involved, in the family business world, they call it the three circle model. So it's kind of like my two gears, but where they overlap. So they talk about ownership, family, and business. So then the family member particularly has to remember which hat he's wearing. I did this slide together with a gentleman in the audience, Benjamin McCarron, if I can ask Ben to come up. Ben and I are both very active in an organization called the Asian Corporate Governance Association. One uh, comment that investors talk about is the alignment of interests. Is the family's wealth all in the listed entity, or is it partly in the listed entity and partly in their own private entities? If it's split, then the family has the option, doesn't mean they're going to do it, but they will have an option to take contracts for their private business if they really like them, and to leave perhaps the less good contract in the public business. Investors should look very carefully at how the family allocates contracts between those businesses. The way that minority interests get protected in listed companies very often is through what are called independent board members. And independence should mean two things. A, independent of management, and B, independent of controlling shareholders. Basically, I think what Ben's highlighting, the issues are different because in the GE widely held, it's more of a principal agent. You're having a, you know, the, C, the management, um, uh, and it's more of a vertical agency issue rather than in a family company where you have a, it's more of a horizontal. It's the family majority shareholder vis-a-vis -vis the minority shareholders. If the family has its act together, at least you know that they're acting with your best interests in the sense that they're, they have their own money at stake. It's not like a five-person removed investment chain, and they have their own reputation at stake. You know, I think the questions I put on the right column that Ben and I worked out together was, you know, if you're an independent director or a minority shareholder, what are the questions you should ask? So. You know, in terms of stakeholder consideration, um, widely held companies will look at shareholder value, maybe a little bit of ESG these days due to pressures. Families will tend to look a little bit more broader in terms of community and such, particularly if, if you know, they're community-based. However, um, is there a risk that you know, the family's just protecting its social status and, and or their jobs? The complicated part is in the middle. That's where the family and the business intersects. Where they intersect is very tricky. So talk about, first of all, succession. If you're senior management at a company, you see a 90-year-old founder and the children not interested, you're going to be kind of worried, what's next? If all the family is, at, is a shareholder, then they want to be able to come to alignment with the non-family management. What's the right proportion between dividend versus reinvestment? Employment of family. Um, frankly, a lot of European family businesses who I know by this third generation, they make a rule. All family members, no one can be in the business. They can only be on the, at most on the board of directors. So the key is how do you really get um, the overlap areas managed? And again, um, in family businesses, it's more of an issue of the family being too engaged with the business or inappropriately. So you've got to create the right kind of boundaries so they can provide the support and the long-term nurturing of the business, but not interfere with the business. So, you know, I think particularly now in the emerging markets, you potentially have four transitions happening at the same time. You're going to have family succession, so you've got 90-year-old Li Ka Xing. You're going to have ownership transfer in terms of how you divide up your shares amongst your children. And then if the family decides not to stay in a management, just stay as an owner, then you have to make the transition from owner-manager to responsible owner. And then the fourth transition is how do you bring in non-family management? So what are the drivers for non-family management? One is globalization. Globalization will drive a big shift in strategy. Uh, family members may not have the talents to capture all of that. And in terms of growth of the business, the business becomes more complex. Again, you need new types of talent that may not be found amongst the family members. If you're a non-family management guy looking to join a family company, what questions should you ask the family? And we boiled down I boiled this down into this little box here, but there's a lot more behind it. 
So one of them is you'd want to ask the family, what's your commitment? What's your strategy as stakeholder? You can look that shareholder in the eye. What's your commitment to the business? Well, well, you want to look for a family company for success. You want to leverage the two gears and make sure they work well together. Um, and taking the page from the Aberdeen guy, you want to be the next biggest shareholder to the family who's a controlling shareholder, provided you agree and are comfortable with that family shareholder. Thirdly, again, the best results is if the founder is in management, and if it's already passed to the next generation, that next generation is, sh is a shareholder, but not in management.